like to say thank you for joining us tonight. The board has just re reconvened into open session, and I would ask that everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. And we will begin with setting the agenda. And I need a motion to amend the agenda to add an item number 11.06, space avail availability at J.M. Robinson High School. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell and a second by Mr. Walter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. So, board members, we will begin with items number 6.01, which are our minutes. And I need to know if there are any corrections or comments or questions. Hearing none, may I have a motion that the minutes of the May 10th, 2021 business meeting and June 7th, 2021 work session be approved as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell, a second by Mr. Furr. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And now I will turn it over to Mr. Schultz for to begin our report section. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, everyone in the audience and viewing uh, online as well. I have a few highlights and reminders about the Cabarrus County Schools staff, community, and our students. Uh, so first off, as a reminder that uh, we have uh, joint COVID vaccine cl clinics with Cabarrus County Schools and the Cabarrus Health Alliance. Uh, the next one is tomorrow, uh, Tuesday at Northwest Cabarrus High School. Uh, followed by June 19th at the Performance Learning Center and uh, clinics to will administer second doses at our schools uh, and those will begin on July 22nd. So to find out when those clinics are, you can visit our headlines and features section of our at our district website. Uh, in addition, our school nutrition department continues to provide summer meals uh, to our children and our community. Meals are uh, free for students ages uh, 1 to 18. Uh, bus routes and stops for meals can be found on the school nutrition uh, website, uh, school nutrition page at our district website. Uh, I have some congratulations and recognitions. Uh, I'd like to congratulate a few staff members. So David Parisi, uh, teacher at, uh, he's an engineering robotics teacher at J.M. Robinson High School. He was named a Life Changer of the Year by the National Life Group, which sponsors a program that recognizes and rewards K-12 educators and school employees across the country and celebrates those who are making a significant uh, difference in the lives of students by exemplifying excellence, positive, positivity, uh, influence, and leadership. So congratulations to Mr. Parisi, and thank you for your great work out there at Jam Robinson uh, and also uh, leading our VEX robotic, uh, robotics program uh, across the district. Uh, Chris Smith, who is principal at Pitt School Road Elementary School, published his uh, first book uh, titled Sign to Story. You can read more about Principal Smith's journey to becoming a publisher, uh, a published author in the article in the Independent Tribune. And then Billy Davis, who's the principal at Patriots STEM Elementary School, completed the T Distinguished Leadership in Practice Program, uh, also known as DLP, which is a year-long leadership development program for practicing school principals designed and provided by the North Carolina Principals and Assistant Principals Association and sponsored by the North Carolina Alliance for School Leadership Development. So congratulations to Mr. Davis. And then we have uh, congratulations in order. The accolades keep coming in for our uh, seniors, uh, our just graduating seniors. Uh, so we have two graduates of Central Cabarrus High School, the class of 2021. That's Jordan Hill and Gabriel Tallenboo. They earned first place national winners for the family career Community Leaders of America, the FCCLA uh, Sustainability Challenge. Their winning entry focused on aquaponics as part of the school's STEM to Fork initiative. So speaking of the class of 2021, you can relive the pomp, circumstance, and celebration of the class of 2021 by watching our 2021 graduation highlights videos. Uh, the highlights video, along with the recordings of each graduation ceremony, 
are posted on the district's YouTube channel. The ceremony recordings are also available on the Cabco Schools TV 21 for Spectrum cable subscribers. And you can find the links to the content on YouTube and the ceremony broadcast schedule on our district website in the new and noteworthy section. So once again, congratulations to the class of 2021. Uh, we had a great time out at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Uh, a couple of them got a little hot out there, uh, but we survived uh, Survived and uh, dodged a couple of raindrops, and, and uh, that was a really wonderful event and time out there celebrating the graduates. Uh, the 2021 school year begins for students and staff at Wolf Meadow Elementary School this week. Uh, the staff return today uh, for their uh, staff uh, work days, and then students return this Thursday, July 15th, uh, I'd like to uh, wish them a great start to their school year and let them know that I will be visiting them on Thursday, greeting them as they come off uh, the bus. So with that, I will close my comments. Thank you. And now we will start with committee reports from board members at 7.02. And I have Ms. Adcock, who is going to give us her report from the CNI committee. Thank you. So uh, I am the liaison for the Board of Education on our curriculum and instruction team. And I wanted to just make some comments um, to the community that it's really important to start out by saying that Cabarrus County School System has been and will continue to be transparent about the curriculum that's being taught to our students in the upcoming school year 2021-22 20, and in all future school years. In April of this year, Dr. Crystal Hill, who was our assistant superintendent, learned that the unpacking documents and other resources from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction would not be approved until June of 2021. She stated this was not enough time for CCS curriculum teams to have written and reviewed new standards prior to implementation. Typically, our school system has a year in which to prepare new standards and for them to be released to write curriculum. So due to these time constraints, the CNI team has not implemented the 2021 social studies standards in any Cabarrus County school. We continue to teach the current social studies standards for all grade levels and courses. So what are the next steps? And I wanna restate again, our CNI team has not and is not changing our social studies standards that were recently approved by the North Carolina State Board of Education for the school year 2021-22. So the CNI committee, which I'm part of, has been very busy meeting to discuss new curriculum being created starting in August for world history, civic literacy, American history, and economics and personal finance. These are all high school related courses that are required for graduation. So they had to be implemented prior to the school year. The CNI committee that has been meeting is made up of parents, teachers, school board members, and curriculum experts from our school system. So I'm going to turn it over to our attorney Jay White to discuss um, House Bill 324, ensuring dignity and non-discrimination. Thank you, Mrs. Adcock. Uh, House Bill 324 is still in the legislature. It has not been voted on. The last update that we found was in May uh, that revised and added some language in the, um, in the bill, and that has not come up for a vote when I checked earlier today. Uh, there is no tracking idea about when that's going to come up. But um, in part and parcel with that is the request of the board to look at a resolution which I ha that was drafted and has been submitted, and we can talk about that later this evening. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. I know you sat on that uh, committee as well. Do you have any comments? Uh, no, they have been working on it, and I think we will have a CNI meeting uh, the end of July. Uh, they have asked both of us to look over. Uh, I know that our uh, team, our curriculum team, they've worked very hard writing. After the unpacking, they have been writing that uh, criteria, and they've asked all of us to kind of go over it if we've got any suggestions or we see anything to let them know when we will be meeting the end of july uh, but again all of 
uh, the team have been working very hard, and uh, so any suggestions we've had or anything that we would like to submit, they've given us the form to submit, but we are working on that, and we will meet in the end of July. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. Schultz? Yeah, thank you, and uh, Ms. Adcock, thank you, and Ms. Carpenter, thank you for serving on that team. Uh, so the, the district curriculum instruction team has evolved a lot this year, so there are some questions that came up about standards and curriculum and and uh we hope to do a report on what the difference between standards and curriculum uh are as well uh when those came up the that team has evolved and to include uh parents teachers administrator board members uh, to thoroughly vet the curriculum that we approve to teach this the standards that we have um, bestowed upon us uh, to teach as educators so i appreciate the leadership uh, with that team. It's really guiding the work for the district uh, on what we uh, teach and do not teach. Um, so I'm very appreciative of Dr. Hill's leadership and the engagement of our Board of Education, uh, parents, teachers, and, and uh, administrators on that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Board members, do you have any comments or questions for Ms. Adcock or Ms. Carpenter? Okay, hearing none. So we will move to 8.01 for the introduction of our new teacher liaison that has joined us and we'll turn this over to Mr. Schultz. Great, uh, besides the, the comments and recognizing our students and staff, uh, this is probably gonna be my favorite, well, it is gonna be my favorite part of the night. So uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome Ms. Ashton Berry over here to my left and your right. Uh, she's the Cabarrus County Schools 2021 Teacher of the Year. Ms. Berry will be serving as the teacher representative on the Cabarrus County uh, Board of Education for the 2021-2022 school year. Uh, she will be serving as uh, this year in the capacity as an Encore Global Studies teacher at W.R. O'Dell Elementary School. Ms. Berry joined Cabarrus County Schools and W.R. O'Dell Elementary School family in 2017 and served as a third grade teacher last school year. She began her, school, uh, she began her teaching career in 2013 outside of the district in Lincoln County Schools. She earned a Bachelor's uh, of Arts degree in elementary education from, wait for it, Appalachian State University, uh, and just completed, last month, just completed a Master's degree in curriculum instruction. So congratulations on that. And in 2020, uh, Ms. Berry was a recipient of the WF and Moselle Costner Parker Endowed Scholarship awarded by the Wright College of Education at Appalachian State University. Uh, we look forward to her contributions as a teacher rep and just appreciate her continued dedica dedication and service to Cabarrus County Schools. And, and I will just say, I was able to um, actually award her this, uh, the Teacher of the Year Award this uh, school year. And what was really I almost get choked up thinking about it. what was really overwhelming about it was um, she had her parents were there and I think your your significant other was there as well and uh, there are a lot of educators in her family her dad is a music teacher and um, but on the zoom phone call that she had were some of uh, that her parents brought in to her classroom in front of her kids which was really cool uh, she had uh, her former, like former teachers, uh, family, and former university professor, former and current university professors there, and it really was uh, really emblematic of the power of education and the power that educators have in people's lives. Oh, so that was really uh, so, sorry. It was really touching to me, and I think one of the reasons why it was so touching is because I didn't have that in my K-12 experience. So to see what the power uh, and the, the camaraderie that that group of uh, people had through education and through educators um, was very powerful. So I um, just want to say that and congratulations. We look forward to having you serve on this, on this team with us. Thank you, Mr. Schultz, Mrs. Grimsley, esteemed board members, and those joining us in person and streaming from home. I feel so honored to serve as this year's teacher liaison and appreciate all of your kind words and your help as I transition into this new role. 
I look forward to cultivating our partnership in order to best serve all of the fantastic and beautifully diverse students, teachers, and families in Cabarrus County. I am so grateful for this privilege and immense responsibility. Thank you, and I just said, Mr. Schultz, I'm supposed to follow that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we want to say welcome on behalf of the board. We do look forward to having you join us and your perspectives that you'll bring from a teacher's point of view. Thank you so much. So anytime that you feel like you need to speak or if there's something going on, you know, we tend to get a little busy up here. Please don't hesitate to key up and ask for the floor. Okay? All right. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. White for 9.01, who's going to start with our resolution um, draft verbiage. And at this point in time, I would like to say on behalf of the board, a formal welcome to you as well, since it's your first meeting joining us, you and um, Mr. Vogel. So with that, you can take it away. Well, it certainly is our privilege to, to be working with the Cabarrus County School System and, and specifically the board and all that y'all bring to the community. It, Y'all do a, a tireless effort, and, and Jonathan and I are, are working, w are glad to work and happy to work with each and every one of you. Uh, one of the things that you've asked to do is for us to come up with a resolution as it relates to what we do support. And the Cabarrus County School System has prided itself on non-discriminatory practices. And going through the school policies, it is incredible the number of back channels, the number of opportunities that y'all have provided in policies to make certain everybody is treated equally, that everybody uh, understands what their role is and that everybody, regardless of their race or their sex, is going to be heard. And that is tremendous. And what, uh, what we tried to do is embody this resolution as to um, all the things that y'all are willing to stand up for, that there is no one race over the other and there is no one sex over the other. And with, the, with that, we all are created equally and we all should be treated equally. And that is so tremendous. And that is what we've done in regards to this resolution. I do think that uh, in regards to this resolution, it doesn't address some issues that the board has, um, it has a lot of vision for, and that is SEL. Uh, it does not address that because it's two different topics. And to merge the two into one resolution can blur the lines about what specifically one topic is as versus another topic. And it really takes away from what y'all's vision is and what y'all are wanting to enact. So this is what the resolution that we have gotten. Mr. Schultz, would you like to make a comment before I read this or would you like to hold that to after? Uh, I think I'll hold that until after, thank you. Okay, so board members, I know you have received copies and you've had time to review and I'm just gonna read this for those that are here with us and, and for the viewing audience. Put it on screen too. Yes, actually, that would be a great idea. Can that be placed on the screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Whereas, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 115C-47, the Cabarrus County Board of Education, known as the school board, is empowered and has the duty to provide students with the opportunity to receive a sound, basic education and to make all policy decisions with that objective in mind. And whereas policies are the primary means by which the school board expresses its vision for the school district. In formulating specific policies, the school board is guided by its duty to provide students with the opportunity to receive a sound basic education and is further guided by governing principles it considers critical to meet, the, meet that obligation by providing a system of excellent schools where students can succeed. And whereas the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction adopts standards while local school boards adopt curriculum, and whereas the Cabarrus County school system, including the teachers, administrators, and all school employees are a dynamic educational team in partnership with our entire community to prepare all students with the knowledge and skills necessary to become successful, responsible, contributing citizens by providing a caring, disciplined, world-class learning environment which challenges students and staff to perform to their potential in a changing competitive world. And whereas the Cabarrus County Board of Education recognizes the importance of diversity of backgrounds, opinions, and expression as foundational to providing students with the opportunity to receive a sound basic education, and whereas the Cabarrus County School Board, the Board of Education is dedicated to providing each student educational opportunities that respect the dignity of others, acknowledge the right of others to express different opinions, 
and foster and defend intellectual honesty, freedom of inquiry and instruction, and freedom of speech and association. And whereas the Caveras County Board of Education recognizes and promotes the equality and rights of all persons as found in the North Carolina Constitution and United States Constitu Constitution. And whereas it is the intent of the Cabarrus County Board of Education to uphold the laws of the land and specifically encourage the Cabarrus County students to learn that all persons are created equally, that no race or sex is inherently superior to another, and that no individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist. Now, therefore, be it resolved by vote of the members of the Cabarrus County Board of Education at a duly called meeting held on July 12, 2021, the Cabarrus County Board of Education and the Cabarrus County School District for the aforementioned reasons will promote, number one, that one race or sex is not inherently superior to another race or sex, number two, that an individual solely by virtue of his or her race or sex is not inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, Number three, that an individual should not be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex. Number four, that an individual's moral character is not determined by his or her race or sex. Number five, that no individual solely by virtue of his or her race bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. Number six, that no individual solely by virtue of his or her race or sex should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress. And number seven, that the United States comprises of persons that are all created equally. Adopted this day, this 12th day of July, 2021. And with that, I will start with board member comments or questions, and I will begin with Ms. Sandage. I don't have any um, questions, but I will say, um, as I said earlier, I just want to make sure if folks have questions relating to this resolution that they are able to submit that somewhere. And I think um, in my understanding, Brian, we are going to address that in some capacity by explaining standards and guideline gu or guiding principles and the ways that we teach. So that's my only comment. Thank you, Ms. Blackwell. No questions. Thank you. Mr. Walter. Um, it says on our discussion, this is a draft resolution. Are we amending the agenda to add this as an action? Or you, I we mean, typically will. we present something one week, we allow the public or allow folks to review it and, and give us their feedback before voting on it. Is that what the intent is or what the, is the intent today to vote so on? So it's actually the board's decision and we'll discuss that as soon as we complete. But that's a good question, so yes. Okay, and you're saying that that's consistent with the proposed bill, Jay, and it's also consistent with policy? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I mean, on an initial read of the draft, it, I, I think it's good that we're ta saying what we believe instead of what we're against. But um, I mean, it seems to be, I don't know what the urgency to vote for it, but uh, it seems to be okay in my initial reading of it. Thank you, Mr. Furr. I would just like uh, everyone to, to understand and to know that this board is totally uh, united on this and uh, we're, on, we're on the same page, and I think we're in agreement with most everyone in the community with, and, and the parents in the community. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter? Will you key up, please? Uh, I agree with Tim and his comments, and uh, uh, I agree with uh, it's a positive type uh, statement, and we are uh, agreeing with where our board stands. Thank you. Ms. Adcock? I just would also say that I agree with everything that this resolution stands for and our agreement as a board to continue do doing what we always have, being equally supportive of all students. Thank you. Mr. Schultz, would you like to make comments now? Yes, thank you. So the um, so I particularly want to point out the, the number three in the resolution, that an individual should not be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex. Um, so uh, that's that's the portion of this that I greatly appreciate. Uh, I was able to actually have serve on the Healthy uh, Cabarrus Advisory Board, and um, they recently completed the findings of a community needs assessment. They do that every four, year, uh, four years in conjunction with uh, Atrium Health and with the uh, Cabarrus Health Alliance. And in the, final, the top three, so they review everything in our community from top to bottom. And uh, what they found was the top three needs in our community 
uh, our mental health, early childhood education, and housing. And, and what they, they showed in that, and housing is an interesting one, right? We think about growth with that. We've had 21% growth in our community over the last uh, 10 years. Um, so it's pretty significant. Uh, but what they're finding out is that people can't afford housing. Um, they're getting priced out of housing uh, and it's taking up a lot of their, their salary and income. Um, but through all that, what they show is this discrepancies across uh, race and, and things like that. And then what we also see in our school district is that we see discrepancies in achievement uh, across our subgroups. And, and so that's significant to me about not being discriminated against uh, based on race or sex. Um, and, and that's something that you know, I wanna continue to work on. When you look at our proficiency scores across our district, we do have big discrepancies on that. And if we want to become the community that we want to become, I think that all of us wanna become, uh, we have to we have to close those gaps with housing. We have to close those gaps with early childhood education. We have to close those gaps uh, with the mental health, uh, and we have to close those uh, gaps with our achievement. Um, so uh, I'm just appreciative of that, and I'm thankful for uh, addressing this issue. And I think you know part of the issues that uh, part of the conversation, the comments that I made earlier about uh, the work of our curriculum instruction committee. Uh, to ensuring that our students are getting the best education in Cabarrus County uh, aligned to uh, what we're supposed to be teaching as educators uh, kind of goes along with this resolution as well. So I appreciate the opportunity for the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, would you like to make any additional comments? No, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. So with that being said, hearing no, nothing else, uh, is it the pleasure of the board to add this and to amend the agenda to adopt this resolution? Ms. Adcock? Yes. Ms. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Furr? Yes. Mr. Walter? I don't think it's urgent, so no. Ms. Blackwell? Yes. Ms. Sandage? Yes. Thank you. That would be six to one with Mr. Walter descending. So may I have a motion that we amend the Can agenda? I ask a question? Sure. Rob, is there something additional that you wanted to add to that? Because I'm just curious. We talk about openness. I just think the public ought to have a right to read this thing and give us their feedback on it. We have feedback. We have public talking in just a few minutes. They may have some comments on it. I'd like to hear that before we would vote on that at, at the minimum. So I'm adding it to the end of the agenda after okay. they speak. Well, if it's a minimum, I mean, that's the minimum. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly going to vote for it. I'm not opposed to it, but I just don't see the urgency. In. It's being added to the end of the agenda. Does that change your decision? To add it to the agenda? No. To the end of the agenda, I said. And it's helpful, helpful but I'm still going to do that. Okay, that's fine. Um, so may I have a motion that we amend the agenda to add approval of the resolution? So moved. I second that. I have a motion by Ms. Adcock and a second by Ms. Carpenter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. That is That passes with 6-1 with Mr. Walter dissent. Okay. All right, thank you. We will add that and make that item number 11.07. And now we will move to 9.02, uh, the discussion of the return to school COVID safety, and I will turn that over to Mr. Schultz. Yeah, so a couple uh, a couple things on return to school. As you know, I, I mentioned that Wolf Meadow will be going back to school this week. Um, so the, the school district is guided, uh, has been guided by uh, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services uh, Strong Schools Toolkit um, that provides guidance for us. So we take we've taken guidance from that. Um, there, uh, we are anticipating an update to that uh, by the end of the month that will then uh, provide us what the uh, governor and then the Department of Health and Human Services guidance is in regards to COVID. Uh, so in terms of any uh, further action or discussion on that, I think we're going to we're going to discuss, potentially discuss that further in the August uh, board meeting. And hearing that board members, is that good enough for you uh, just to have the discussion at the August meeting? I mean, I wasn't, I felt sure with the mandate expiring the end of July, we really wasn't a need to add an extra meeting, but I'd like to have comments from all of you. Ms. Adcock. Uh, just for clarification, so the end of July, there will be the uh, mask mandate will be dropped. Is that correct? Supposedly. <laughs> and I'm okay with us waiting till August. Ms. Carpenter. That's, that's, that's fine with me. Okay. 
Mr. Burr. Well, I don't, I don't want to wait, but I understand why we're going to wait. But uh, I just, I think we understand that we're not sending our kids back to school with masks, regardless of what. I didn't mean for that. Thank you, guys. All right, Mr. Walker. Uh, my position, it should be voluntary. If there's a family member, family wants to wear a mask, they should. If they don't, they don't need to. I say ditto to Tim and Rob. Okay. Miss Sandage. I'm all about choice. Would y'all like to tell us how you really feel right now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And of course, all of you, I probably talked to half of you in this room this weekend, and you know, I feel the same way. So we will not um, decide, we'll decide not to have an extra meeting in July. We'll do it all, August the 2nd. Well, we know pretty much where the board's going anyway, but we'll just keep that on the agenda for them. Good. Okay. All right. With that being said, we will move to guest speakers. Um, so I need to read a very long uh, paragraph, so bear with me. In accordance with the board policy 2310, a part of each business meeting will be set aside for citizens to address the board through public comment. Each speaker will receive three minutes to present comments. If you have been told that you have five and you are represented a group, just know that that's understood. Sign up will be available 30 minutes before the meeting begins. Speakers must sign up with the board clerk no later than the normal start time of the regularly scheduled monthly business meeting. Speakers may sign up with the board clerk via email at boardclerk at cabarrus.k12.nc.us or by completing a contact information card. Speakers must include their name, group, group name if applicable, address and phone number, and list the general education related topic of their presentation for the board minutes. During the public comment period, the board chair will recognize speakers in the order in which they signed in. Substitute, substitute speakers will not be permitted, and speakers may not donate any portion of their time to another speaker. If a speaker is unable to present all of his or her information within the specified time limit, the speaker may provide the board with the additional information in written form. If an unusually large number of people request to speak, a majority of the board may decide to reduce the time for each individual or to require the designation of a spokesperson for each group of persons supporting or opposing the same positions. At any time, the board may establish additional procedures to ensure that public comment sessions proceed in an efficient and orderly manner. Board members will not respond to individuals who address the board except to request clarification of ports made by the presenter, except in cases of emergency. Information received during presentations will not be acted upon at that time it is received. It will take a unanimous vote of the board members present to take action on a presentation considered to be of an unusual or emergency nature at the time it is presented. Disruptions by any person or persons of a public meeting will be subject to action in accordance with General Statute 143-318-17. And before we get started with the uh, speakers, I want to thank the SRO for being here tonight who will help us and guide us through this uh, process. So we will begin with speaker number one, and that is Jessica Mumford. You may present to the podium, and if you will, just make sure you turn your mic on so I can give you the sign to start. Thank you for being with us tonight, you're ready. Good evening, Chairman of the Board and Board Members. My name is actually Kizzy is what I go by, but Jessica Mumford. I'm new to your community. I have four students, and I have 10 years of teaching ex experience. Social emotional learning has been billed as a transformative tool that will propel students to greater academic achievement and personal fulfillment. Unfortunately, it is becoming a tool to engineer social thought, undermining the influence of parental rights, religions, cultural tra traditions, and worldviews. Jane Robbins, author of Social Emotional Learning, K-12 Education as the New Age Nanny State, is an attorney and independent researcher who has spoken before 12 state legislations and the US Congress. She writes, quote, it's one thing to direct your own moral, ethical, and emotional development of your children, but having a government vendor or an unqualified public school official implement SEL curriculum based on coffee table psychology is quite another. Social emotional learning seeks to determine sensitive personal information, much of which occurs without the consent of parents or students. This poses a risk to student privacy and parental rights. I experienced this firsthand with my second grader in 2020. 
Every year, we turn in this notice of reasonable expectations of privacy from our lawyers. We hand it to our superintendent, our principal, and every classroom teacher of our four children. Number two states that our child will, quote, not be subjected to any tests, questions, or assignments that probe our child on family values, political views, health, medical, or mental, morality, family life, or religion. One day, my son asked me, Mommy, do you know what my strengths are? I'm going to start crying because I said, of course, I'm your mom. I know what you are. You're kind. You're gentle. All of these things. My seven-year-old said, no, I'm a social justice warrior. I asked him what it meant. He couldn't tell me. I asked him how he learned that. He told me that he took a test at school, and I told him that's what he was good at. The school board refused to show us the test and our son's answers. The CEO of Thrively, the online assessment tool, finally released the test questions and my son's answers after threats of litigation. The, ass test, the assessment consisted of 78 questions probing my child on morals, beliefs, family values, and subtly informing my student what he should think and how he should feel. We found this assessment had been given three times that year against our parental rights. According to the California Globe, over 200,000 children in California, four of them being mine, left the local school district from the start of the pandemic because, quote, parents are removing students due to issues over what is being taught. We joined those parents that refused to let the school weaponize our children with SEL as a guide to engineer social thought and teach the level of morality that the school chose to teach. Your school system mental health plan, which is on tonight's agenda, has to align to SHLT-003. We as parents are not asking you to go against state policy. However, the board of State Board of Education clearly gives school boards the freedom to direct their own policy and curriculum. Students do not, or excuse me, parents do not want SEL to be, quote, integrated across the curriculum and within the entire school environment as a tool to prove ch probe children's beliefs and circumvent parental rights. SEL is becoming a feeder system into critical race theory. We just heard that, and we inform parents will not stand for that. Thank you. Ms. Muffer, I have a question. Sorry. All right, thank you guys. Um, what is the date of that test it was given? Uh, 2020, March of 2020 is when my son was given that from Thrively, the online assessment tool. Okay. Was that yeah. No, this is in California. California. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted a, the time frame. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Speaker number two, Lee Brown. So guys, I'm gonna ask that you don't do that so that we delay the meeting, okay? Thank you for joining us. Your mic is on and you can get started. First of all, thank you for each of you for your time and your willingness to serve our community. I'd like to address a couple of things tonight. The first one being some of the comments made based on this resolution. The comment that education is bestowed upon us by the state means that the buck can be passed. I and all other parents in this county will say to you kindly and firmly, stop passing the buck. Stand up in Cabarrus County and say we will not put that curriculum into place. We do accept our responsibility. And Superintendent, yes, I had educators who changed my lives. I am a product of Cabarrus County Schools. I went to Odell, I went to Northwest, I went to Northwest. The teachers who changed my life, most of them are dead now because I'm old too, but they would be appalled to find out that any of our children would be separated from their teachers with curriculum that is not designed to give them facts and to give them love of this country and to understand the amazingness of this country. And so if we're going to talk curriculum, we better be talking the 1776 Unites and not the 1619 product. And so if you want to talk about the power of educators, let's talk about how we can keep these masks out of our schools. Why are y'all waiting until August? If you don't want masks, stand up now and say we're not doing it. Do you understand? There is a health impact on our kids. They are breathing their own exhaust. The kids are addicted to these masks. They're afraid of interactions right now. They're losing their social ability to read each other, to connect, and the physiological impacts are going to be felt for decades. My brother is a firefighter. Do you know how many suicide calls they get from under 15 year olds right now because kids no longer know how to connect? And you know you talk about the power of educators, man, teachers, and their best connect to kids, but they sure can't do it when there's an uneven power system where the kids are muzzled and the adults are not. To me, that looks like child abuse. Take the masks off our kids. Do it now and do it proudly, indoor, outdoor, in the hallway, and tell these kids to read 
connect to one another, be humans and part of a community, because that's what makes Cabarrus County great. It's the community here. Everywhere the humans in this community matter. And the longer we say that Mandy Cohen and Raleigh can decide what goes on my kid's face, and I didn't elect her, then the longer it's going to be before we get each other back on the same page and start pulling together. And then you want to solve the educational gaps. Then let's fix the family. The school should get back behind moms and dads staying together, parents doing the best that they can, support them through whatever you can. And I'm not saying that if your family busted up that that's your fault. I'm saying as a school system we could support the families. The churches want to support the families, but that's where the gaps get solved. So we've got to be bold enough to fight the organizations that push things like critical race theory, because one of the underpinnings of critical race theory is destroying the family. I won't stand for it. I appreciate y'all and thank you. Speaker number three is Steve Nelson. Your mic is on and you can get started. Thank you. Thank you, board. Um, my comments are stale in light of the resolution that's discussed. I uh, highly encourage the board to pass the resolution. My question is, what teeth does the resolution have? Um, we saw earlier this year the Facebook page, Make a Difference, showed quite a lot of political indoctrination going on in Cabarrus County Schools. There was bullying of students. Two teachers in Central Cabarrus High School come to mind. Um, at an elementary school, there was a social justice lesson at one point. Uh, we saw BLM posters in the classroom, lesson plans that denigrated conservative viewpoints, social media activity that blatantly broke board policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. So the resolution is great. What teeth does it have? Because certain teachers are just breaking policy all the time. On this topic of critical race theory, whatever we call it, social emotional learning, uh, culturally responsive teaching, um, at the end of the day, what we permit, we promote. This is not the time to go along, to get along. I think this is the time to take a stand against political indoctrination of our kids. And if you are biblically minded, recall Matthew 18, 6, Jesus said of the little children, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Also, take the mask off. Thank you. Speaker number four is Elizabeth Rory. Good evening. Hi. Your mic is on and you can get started. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Elizabeth Rory. I have children in the Cabarrus County School System. I have been deeply disturbed by some of the teachings in the Cabarrus County Schools. I am against all teachings of CRT and SEL, known as critical race theory. Just the name of critical race theory is negative. This is a theory about races and differences. Edweek.org stated critical race theory is an academic concept that race is a social construct and that racism is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but something also embedded in legal systems and policies. So if it's embedded, how can we say it is embedded into each and every individual? And who gets to decide that it's embedded in our legal systems and policies? I say this was never voted on by the American people. The voice of the American Americans is to be heard, not stopped. Lastly, why would this be introduced to our most innocent and honest of society, our children? People in authorities, such as teachers and politicians, should never put themselves in a position where a child is at the mercy of teachings that has not been approved on or is disapproved by society and their parents. This issue, CRT, which is still stated as a theory, is for adults to discuss. Teachers will be putting children in the middle, and that's abusive. We ask that you to teach what is, has been working in America. Our school systems could improve, yes, but not to teach differences on who and who doesn't have an advantage in society. Our education that most, if not all, in this room received in public schools set up the platform for America to have its first black president, our first minority woman vice president, and countless other people of all races to be leaders in private and public life. Americans champion all individuals regardless of race in this country. So if CRT is pursued, then tell me, this tells me that our educators view race as inequality, not the parents or the communities. We are unified as American people as a majority 
look on character content, and we ask that this principle is applied to our children. And those who view critical race theory as honest history are actually rewriting history. Who better to tell the story of history than those who have lived it? And we have the stories and facts of those who have lived it. What's honest is not to rewrite or erase history for a platform which is divisive to mankind. History is to be learned from, not erased. Currently, 26 states have introduced legislation to restrict CRT from the classroom. And every poll I see in the news states the majority of Americans see this as a negative teaching. I implore you to be strong and courageous and do the right thing for our children. If we as adults want to debate this theory, then by all means, let's debate in the correct setting with adults. But this is not a theory that should be introduced to our best and brightest of society and our future, our children. I look forward to the next board meeting where we can say how the voice of Americans is being heard. We say no to CRT. Thank you for your time and supporting of, and protecting our wonderful children while teaching our children in a safe environment. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker number five is Daniel Helms. Good evening. Good evening. Your mic's on and you can get started. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity tonight. Uh, my name is Daniel Helms and I've taught in uh, social studies at Northwest Cabarrus High School for the last 16 years. I'm also the parent of a CCS student. I did want to address uh, the resolution on item uh, 9.01 ton on tonight's agenda. Um, I, like every teacher that I've ever come across and taught with in my years, do value students as I see the board does as well and I, and I thank y'all for that. Um, what I did want to say, however, though, is that I believe that there's a lot of opinion out there and frankly some misinformation. Um, so I, I just wanted to take a moment to maybe from a teacher standpoint present what our teachers go through in order to present the lessons and prepare for the lessons that we teach in our classrooms, especially in the social studies. Um, as a social studies teacher, what I practice and what I work to teach my students is that when we discuss something controversial, we need to understand the factual information involved so we can frame any critical analysis around those facts. When we prepare our lessons, we analyze the state standards, the curriculum documents that has been passed by Cabarrus County and are written by their teachers, and in consultation with our professional learning communities, create lessons that address those standards. Then we teach the facts. We instruct students to read and analyze historical documents and to think critically about those documents in order to make their own judgments. We ask questions like, how should we evaluate historical figures? Or was this person justified in making such a decision? These questions address objectives 1.3 and 1.4 in the current NC American History Essential Standards, which read, use historical analysis and interpretation to evaluate competing historical narratives and debates among, his among historians and use historical research to support interpretations with historical evidence. In doing so, we teach the critical thinking skills that the public has long been begging to be taught in schools. And I ask, isn't that what we're hired to do? Some of this history makes us uncomfortable. History is the story of human beings, which by nature are imperfect. But then the question becomes, how do I teach something like Bacon's Rebellion, or the Indian Removal Act, or the trafficking of enslaved Africans, or Japanese internment, if in doing so I run the risk of someone feeling aggrieved. I believe our focus should be currently be on pressing our legislatures to fund our schools to provide resources for teachers to be successful in the classrooms, to attract the best teachers and support personnel, and ensure we have counselors, nurses, and health professionals in the school to provide and offer the sound basic education we are promising. I have a daughter who's a rising second grader at Boger. She's had a wonderful experience. And I'm excited about this county preparing my daughter with the 21st century skills to understand the world and the diversity around her. I would like our board to focus on the well-rounded education of the teachers, that the teachers in this county are capable of imparting to her and the other students. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here tonight. Okay, board members, that was our last speaker. So we will be moving to the action agenda items under 11.01 and we will begin with Mr. Brian Cohn, the R. Brown McAllister Elementary School Property Exchange Agreement approval. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, back in April 6 of 2020, I brought before this board a request 
with the approval of a resolution for the exchange of property between Mr. and Mrs. Robert Tucker and Cabarrus County Schools for land located at the existing R. Brown McAllister Elementary School site. During November of, the, of that year, this board met at a closed session and it was discussed that we would be bringing before you an agreement for the exchange of these properties. Cabarrus County Schools has satisfied the statute and provided a 10-day notice by publication describing the properties to be exchanged, stating the value of the properties and other consideration changing hands. Attached tonight is the agreement to exchange real estate, defining the terms and the conditions for your approval. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, board members, any comments or questions? And I will start with Ms. Sandage. Okay. I mean, start okay, let's do, let's stay in order. Ms. Sandage. I don't have any comments or questions. Okay. Ms. Blackwell. I don't have any. Walter. What was the value? Uh, the, the value is, uh, it's, it's equal value because it's a like exchange, 33,500 for the school property and 33,000 for the Tucker property. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Furr. No questions. Ms. Carpenter. You know, Miss Carpenter, always. I was waiting. You were waiting. Well, uh, I'm gonna put you up here on the hot plate now. Oh, okay. Because okay. I've I've done some additional uh, work here, uh, because I've been working my legs a little bit. Uh, because when we originally went to that site, we went to the front part of the site. That hole's big. And I don't know, we have got some new board members on this board now. And first of all, I'm going to ask, how many board members have actually gone to that site and seen the hole we're getting ready to put that school in? Recently, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, how many? I mean, all right. And we're going to put that school in a hole, a big hole. I mean, a big hole. I seen the front side, but I have now gone to the back side. And, and, and I, first of all, how much extra cost are we going to have on that school? Because I've, I've been looking at a lot of the plans, and I know there's a big retaining wall that we're going to have to have to shore up a guy's swimming pool and his land. And I want to know how we're going to get rid of all that water that's going to be coming from all those hills that are coming down. That, uh, now, get all these questions now. How we're going to get rid of that water, because I know that there's been a lot of flooding on, um, on actually, um, Herod, is it Hermitage? Hermitage, yes. Uh, there was a bunch of flooding there, so, and that was just on what's there now. So how we're going to get rid of that water, has there been an in, uh, environmental impact study of when we, if we get rid of that water, where that water's going to go, and was there an in, in, environmental impact study on what it, where that water's going to go to when we get rid of it? Now, how are we going to get rid of it, too? That was another question. Extra cost of the project, how, you know, cause including the retaining wall, and how we're going to get rid of the water, because I know them pipes are going to cost an awful lot. And if there's been an in, environmental impact study done on that. Okay. So the, to, to clarify, the, the school will not be built in a hole. It, the, the, the school, where's it going to be built? Well, the, so the, the area you're talking about is the low point on the property, but there is a shelf on that property that's about 70 foot higher than where that is that you're speaking of. So the school will be built on the highest portion of the property itself. So we won't be building the school in a hole. And I can assure you that the, the properties in question that we will be abutting that need retaining wall structures, we will adequately take care of those and make sure that we don't rush any water or run anything off onto their property. And then thirdly, all the drainage from the school will drain down into the tributary that runs into Three Mile Branch that you're speaking of on Hermitage. So there we, we have done uh, we have done test pit studies on the site already and, and identified that we do have good quality soil on there that we'll be able to cut and fill on this site in order to create a buildable pad. So it's going to be up high. It's not going to be in that hole. It, You're assuring me that school's not going to be in that hole. Yes, ma'am. The school will be lower than the existing school. I will probably tell you that, but it won't be in a hole. 
It's not going to be in the hall. No, is that going to be a one or two or three story school? That is yet to be determined, Miss yeah, Carpenter. It's going to be a basement school. It's going to be, it's, it's gonna be a multi story facility, yes, ma'am. But it's not going to be in that hall. Yeah. I, you're going you to write a statement. You're not putting that school in that I will, hall. I will write you a statement, Miss Carpenter. That it's not going to be, and so we're not going to have to do. No. We did not do an environmental impact study we, then on that, or we, we, we did? have done we have done the uh, test pit study on the on the dirt to know what soils are like, and when we get further along in the design and the concepts of the school, then we'll do more definitive soil boring studies. So we will be performing additional studies on the site. So we don't know really though how much did we know how much more it's going to cost though than a regular school because. I know those retaining walls cost an arm and a leg. Yeah, we, we haven't identified the total cost yet. We have a budget. So. Well, I know we got okay. a budget, but we don't we really know how want, much. We really want this agreement I have to think though, about so. our taxpayers now here, and I don't want to. Because I want to make Miss Tucker happy and make sure I get her agreement approved. Well, I, so I would Mr. like Powell, to do that. Me, maybe, Miss Carpenter, let, did you send anything to them? Earlier. Huh? Did you send anything to them earlier with your questions? Who? Brian or me yeah. or anybody? No, because I mean, a lot of this so stuff I just found me. out. I mean, okay. I was finishing so up a lot of my stuff today, and that's why right. at at two thirty. So it was a little. <laughs> if I was finishing up a lot of it okay. today, and I, I'm sorry that's for okay. that. That's okay. You know but, the process, and it would have helped a whole lot to. Have and had since that, I just got that. back on Sunday, it I know was you it, did. it was short notice. That's okay. Do you have any other questions? Uh, well, that was that was the main part of it. But as long as we're not, my I was real concerned when I saw the fact part of that like say when we saw the original part but I would like the board members that had not saw the site I really would like the rest of our especially our newer board members to see that site that have not had the opportunity to see it so uh, so to clarify that. we're giving the the exchange the piece that we are exchanging with the Tuckers we're exchanging our piece that is the lowest point on the property if okay that helps. and the piece that we're getting from them is actually a higher elevation piece so we are on the higher ledge because yes, that was a concern that we were going to be in a hole because some of the people thought, man, why in the world are you putting that thing in a hole? So that's, so, so we I'm are going to interrupt one more time just because you had the layout at the last meeting yes, that showed that. So do you have your layout that was provided to you the last meeting? That you actually showed the, the property and where it was going. Okay. So maybe we need to have you go over that with Brian yourself. Okay. Because I think because unless like somebody else that. has a concern or question about that location, which is what we did go over last time. See, okay. I was on the phone, so it's hard and to that's see. What I was to say. It's hard to person. see over the right. phone. No, that's fine. How about, <laughs> how about, well, you got your documents on board, Doc, so don't go there. Okay. <laughs> All okay. right. So um, how about you do that? Okay. That'll make, answer your questions, because I think if you see where that actually is located, it'll look different to you. Okay. Okay. What else have we got? That's it. That's okay. It. Very good. All right. Ms. Adcock. No questions. Thank you. Okay, so with that being said, may I have a motion that the agreement to exchange real estate located at the existing R. Brown McAllister Elementary School be approved as presented? So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell. Second. Second by Ms. Adcock. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. You're good. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to move to 11.02, policies for approval on first reading. I know we have a lot of people here tonight that came to hear the speakers. If you want to leave at this point in time, you feel welcome to. We appreciate you being here. We, you know, we've, we've uh, enjoyed your comments uh, tonight, and, um, but we respectfully would say if you would like to leave now and you're not feeling that you want to interrupt the, move, move, uh, the um, meeting or you know, if you're, you're more than welcome to stay, okay? Thank you. Okay, 11.02, policies for approval on first reading. And Ms. Burns is gonna join us. I'm just gonna do what we normally do, Sounds read good. those down, make sure if we have any comments or questions and we'll go from there. Right. So we have policy 1510 for, slash 4200 slash 7270, school safety, 1610 slash 7800, professional and staff development, policy 2610, board attorney, 3300, school calendar and time for learning, 3460, graduation requirements. 3610, counseling program. 4040 slash 7310, staff student relations. 4125, homeless students. 
4150 student assignment. I'm sorry? No, I'm going to read them in you. 4125 homeless students, 4150 student assignment transfer and program choice enrollment. 4240 slash 7312 child abuse and related threats to child safety. 4335 criminal behavior. 6120 student health services. 6320 use of student transportation services and 8341 limited claim settlement so with that i will ask for any board members questions or comments and just state the board policy and i will begin with miss adcock i don't have any questions or comments okay miss carpenter no. mr fur no. mr walter uh, 4150 and mr basilis can you kind of explain to us what the change is in the hard hardship or why for removing the principal's input on this? Or? Thank you, Mr. Walter. So one of the things I'm trying to focus on in the year ahead is to do everything we can to ensure our principals can make their focus the instructional leadership in their buildings. Realistically, the, um, the inclusion of principal to principal feedback is something of an anachronism. It, it predates the time where we had things like NCYs or Power School where you could uh, see what's going on in terms of a student's academic performance, absences, and attendance. So it's in, in principle, it's become something that is, um, that our technology has sort of outrun the need for the principal to principal communication. So prior to something like PowerSchool or NCYs, where we could check that, um, there'd be no way for the principal at the receiving school to know that the student was in good academic standing and good behavioral standing. Does that make sense? It does, and I appreciate that okay, explanation. Sure. It makes, makes more sense now when I read it. Okay, sure, of course. Is that it? Okay, Ms. Blackwell? No question. Ms. Sandage? I don't have any. Okay. So then we will move to policies on second reading, 11.03. Policy number 1720 slash 4015 slash 7225, discrimination, harassment, and bullying complaint procedure. Policy 1740 slash 4010 slash 5001, student and parent grievous, grievance procedure. Policy number 2127, board member technology use. Policy number 3200, selection of instructional materials. Policy number 7335, employee use of social media and electronic communications. And policy 7340, employee dress and appearance. And I will begin with Ms. Sandage. Madam Chair, before you get to there, yeah. um, I don't remember hearing a vote on 1102. No, a mo motion or a vote on the policy revisions for approval on first reading. I'll make the motion. Okay, I'll second. All right. So on 1102, okay, I probably did miss that. Okay, let me just reread the motion. May I have a motion that the policy revisions for approval on first reading be approved as presented? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Walter, second by Ms. Blackwell. All those in favor say aye. Thank you. All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you, Mr. White. Feel free to catch me at any given time with that. <laughs> These tend to run together after so long. Okay, now we will begin with uh, comments or questions from board members on second reading policies. Ms. Sandage. I don't have any questions, but I do have a comment, and it's pretty much just to let the public know. We get to see these policies several times before any of this happens. So, you know, when it looks like we don't have questions or, or comments, that would be the reason why, and not that we're just not here, not paying attention. So, that was it. Thank you for acknowledging you do your job. <laughs> Ms. Blackwell? No questions. Mr. Walter? I'm good. Mr. Furr? I'm good. Ms. Carpenter? Ms. Adcock, yes, most of these we could probably recite in our sleep after we've reviewed so many times. Okay, Mr. Walter, did you have anything else? Okay, so now may I have a motion that the policy revisions for approval on second reading be approved as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell and a second by Ms. Adcock. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burns. 
Now we will move to 11.04, 2021-2022 approval of student fees, and we will have Mr. Ben Allred to the podium. Good evening. Thank you. So I get to come every year and talk about student fees. There was a change in policy this year that separated the fees that are district uh, organized and those that can be approved at the school level. So what I've done is I've given you kind of our current policy. It may not be in color for you. I've put it in a nice magenta for me. Um, and then you have the uh, new proposed policy, which streamlines things. So just an example of something in there, advanced placement courses at each school have uh, fees. You can see that those fees vary somewhere between 18 and $25. Instead of quoting every AP and every IB course, we will just cap the fee for all courses at a district fee uh, of $25. So what that doesn't mean is that a teacher of an AP course gets to collect $25 from every student. What it does mean is that teacher has the obligation to purchase something within $25 that they will use for the course. If they don't need anything, they don't collect a fee from students. If they use something, they document it, they can't go over $25. If they need to go over $25, they can requisition their principal and say, will you approve this? And it becomes a school level and then we bring it back to the board. So the other thing that gets addressed is what would be 4,600, the new B, which is those fees which can now be at the school level. So we're gonna do something a little different this year um, to collect those. And a lot of this comes from uh, comments that Mr. Walters had over the previous years about what gets charged to students. Uh, we have admissions to concerts, choral events, athletic events, there's t-shirts, there's concessions, vending, field trips. It's a lot of stuff. Uh, Ms. Klutz has come before the board with lists before showing how voluminous they can be and also how hard it is to track in a moment. Um, but here's what I do know. Those are not surprises. So uh, the chorus teacher knows uh, what he or she is going to charge to the admission to the concert. The t-shirt has a price. The hot dog is already on a menu. So we're going to collect those in real time. It'll take about a year for us to gather what those fees are and what those charges are to our students. Uh, but we'll have a very clear idea of what those are K-12 because, again, they're no surprise. The principal uh, either directly or indirectly um, approves those through designees, and we'll collect those this year. We'll begin doing that in August uh, as school starts, and we'll collect those each month. Um, we'll put those in a board report quarterly so you can review those. It'll do a couple of things. It'll answer the question of what are schools charging students and what is available to purchase. It'll also help us maintain some consistency and look for discrepancies between schools and just give us an idea of what's out there. So that's kind of the update for the changes. If you have any questions, I'll take those. Okay, thank you. And we will begin with Ms. Adcock. Comments or questions? I don't have any comments or questions. Ms. Carpenter? Only question I have, and, and it's kind of in the same range. How do we monitor like our boost clubs and things like that? I, I got, uh huh? An attorney question. Attorney <laughs> question. Hey, attorney question. How do we do that? And, 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 and I'll be honest with you, the only thing, only reason I'm asking, of course, uh, good old horror stories I saw in the paper where uh, some booster cub, and I'm not going to mention any names because everybody will know, but one booster cub had embezzled $200,000, $400,000, something like that. Wasn't ours, but what I'm saying, uh, and I'm sure we've got such an excellent, you know, accounting system, but I just want to make sure that we've got the, what we need to do. Okay, attorney, how do we, how do we do that? When you, I did not hear your whole full question. I got lost there. I, I, I ran my discussion. Uh, uh, how do how do we handle our booster clubs and and things like that? The booster clubs is, from my understanding, is a separate entity than what we have through the school system. So that the that is completely part and parcel from the actual schools. Yeah, but how do we keep from having instances where embezzlement of four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars is? You don't oversee the booster clubs. Yeah. In other words, we have no authority right, with you those don't have the authority over the booster clubs. Well, how do we keep embezzlement from happening? If you would like to get rid of the booster clubs, I think that would be a problem. But no, you, that is they're a separate entity. So there's nothing we can do. Correct. <laughs> Mr. Farr? Uh, no. Mr. Walter? I think your uh, proposal and your idea there and 
is a great step forward. And I think that's going to help a lot of us being transparent and seeing what the fees are. Um, on this particular chart here, are there any changes from the prior year? No, there actually are not any changes. Um, the fact that we look, went for those district maximums, you can see that I separated out into fixed and standard fees, those that are maximum fees allowed, and then optional. Um, it's a little fluid. Some of those ones in the fixed and standard are also optional, but um, it kind of worked out the way so it was So we still charge the 5 or $10 fee every year? We don't charge the 5 or $10 fee every year? Yes, uh, it's included. It's the second fee. It used to be a $10 fee, and we wrapped the technology fee inside it. So that's a $20 fee annually instead of $10. That changed last year. Okay. All right, thank you. Ms. Blackwell. Sure. I just want to say thank you, Ben, for doing this. Um, I know that this has been something that has been um, an issue you know, with the transparency and, and how we're doing these fees. So I think that this is a great solution to that. Um, so I appreciate all of your hard work. Ms. Sandage. And excuse me if I've missed this somewhere, and I'm asking and it's already been answered somewhere, but I don't know, so I'm going to ask you anyway. If there is a student who cannot afford, um, is there something in place for that? Sure. And so, can you explain it so that people know where to find it? <laughs> yes, I can explain it. So if you'll notice at the bottom, there's an asterisk there, and I'll read it. Any fees imposed will be waived or reduced for students who demonstrate real economic hardship. The principals we will be responsible for establishing procedures to review requests for fee waivers or reductions. Um, that obviously varies from school to school, teacher to teacher, um, event to event. But the bottom line is the situations that I've been involved in, the things that I hear are overwhelmingly positive. Most teachers, coaches, um, club advisors, they know up front who's going to struggle. Our goal is that 100% of students can participate in activities or events that they want to. The truth is, is many times collecting these fees is a way to offset uh, those that cannot afford it anyway. And um, very few classrooms, very few um, uh, clubs or whatever collect 100% of dues. I don't know the data on our annual instructional fee, but I know we don't collect 100% of that $10 and $20 fee. Uh, most of that is to offset anyway, but um, that's a process at the school level. The process for, if that doesn't work, follows our normal either complaint or grievance process, but it very rare, rarely gets to that. I've not had personal knowledge of um, issues in my 10 years here. So if a student has um, problems getting or paying for a course, they should go to their principal and, and have teacher, that. Teacher, okay. their principal, a counselor, a trusted adult at the school, parent call. That's all I have. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ben, that was a great clarification. So thank you for doing that. And we would hope that principals and teachers are making sure that they're cognizant of that issue with students. I, I know it's their goal. Absolutely. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, board members, may I have a motion that policy 4600 student fees be approved as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell, a second by Ms. Carpenter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. Motion pa passes 7 0. Now we will move to 11.05, which is the vacate a right of way at Wolf Meadow Elementary, and I will turn it over to Board Attorney Jay White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen of the board, there is, back when Wolf Meadow was being developed, there was an easement that was provided to the Scraparis County school system uh, in case the school needed an access road from the school all the way up to Highway 29. That's to the west of the property. And then uh, that was in conjunction with an easement that was provided for the current um, ingress and egress on Wolf Meadow Road that is off of Farm Pond, I believe it is. Now that the Philip Morris property is being developed, there is, uh, there is an opportunity for this, this part of the property to be developed. And uh, this right of way has not been used for the school system ever and is being asked to vacate that right of way to allow the property to be developed and unencumbered by that right of way that we have. So that is what we have tonight is the opportunity to vacate so the property can be developed. Uh, and in, in an indirect way, there will be um, help to the Cabarrus County citizens reducing taxes because of the businesses that are coming in and hopefully getting more money to the school system from a taxpayer that is not going to be putting kids in school. Thank you for that. Ms. Adcock, I'm going to start with you with comments or questions. 
I don't have any comments or questions. Ms. Carpenter? I have none. Mr. Furr? I have none. Mr. Walter? Yeah. Um, what's the acreage of this easement? I did not figure out the acreage of the easement. I can try and do that. It is basically a two lane road going in and out um, on the left hand side, or excuse me, on the and west my, side of the, of the school system. My guess is 4,000 feet, but. I, yeah. I never like to guess because typically. I, I, I don't have a guess. See, that's, <laughs> it'd be nice to have that information because easements do have value, especially that something that, le that lengthy. They um, do. And, and I will tell you that from what my records are, the school system never paid for the easement in the first place, mm -hmm. never paid for the right of way in the first place. So that it was a gift back in 1978. And I guess you can look but, at it as a gift back. But it's not a gift back to the county. It's not a gift back to the city. It's a gift back to a private entity, as I understand it. It was gifted to from a private entity. At the time, it was Philip Morris. So it came from Philip Morris to the Cabarrus County School System and it would be going back to the current property owner. I'm just not comfortable without knowing what the, the value of that would be to be able to support this at the time. Ms. Blackwell? No questions. Ms. Sandage? Rob, I hear you loud and clear. Um, I agree with your concerns, but I, I don't have any questions. Okay. So, Mr. Walter? Uh, okay. Are you... I mean, do you want us to look into anything else? My well, thought is I mean, we, we, we are in partnership with the county who's requesting it. It's not the individual, so. But we're still doing it to a, a private company. I can't, I'm just not comfortable with that without knowing the value of this and how the exact acreage, acreage of it. We don't even have that. So it's just a map that we've been presented. Um, I'm just not prepared to vote for that. Okay, so board members, I'm going to ask for a motion that we approve the vacate right away at Wolf Meadow Elementary School. So approved. I'll make a motion. Okay, motion by Mr. Furr. I'll second. Second by Ms. Blackwell. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, motion passes 6 1 with Mr. Walter descending. Okay, thank you. And we'll, with that, that concludes all of our business uh, for tonight oh no I'm sorry you're right <laughs> thank you so 11.06 that we added which is the uh, resolution <laughs> is my J yes it is I'm sorry I, you know what Karina I think I'm gonna have to have this in larger font how about that <laughs> all right so let me gather that so 11.06 yeah is um, the regarding of the space, avail space availability at J.M. Robinson High School. So we will have Mr. Basilis to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, in alignment with um, Cabarrus County Schools Policy 4130, um, Section A2 states that the board must determine that space is available um, in the school t system at a particular school uh, or program to allow an out-of-district student to enroll, and we had such an occasion. And the, um, the specific school we're talking about is J.M. Robinson High School. I wanted to update the board and give them, give you all, um, the projected numbers that were uh, that we have for the 21-22 uh, school year. And essentially, J.M. Robinson has of our um, our full service high schools that are not program choice, like early colleges or PLCs. J.M. Robinson has the second lowest number of students total and has the lowest utilization uh, percentages. Um, so in terms of determining their space, there seem to, that certainly is your prerogative to make that determination. But the um, utilization numbers I have are 62%. So is that so, current number or the projected number? Those are the projected numbers for, for the 21-22 okay. school year. Um, and so with those numbers, I would um, respectfully ask you all to allow the addition of this one student. Okay, board members, comments or questions, and I'm going to start with Ms. Sandage. No questions. Um, I would agree with allowing the student given the um, projected capacity. Um, the comment that I will make is that I received an email asking about, you know, transferring in, in, in a case similar to this, and I just want to make sure that we communicate for the public how they 
engage in this process. Um, I think when folks reach out to us, it's because they don't know where else to go. And I, I know that's what we're here for, but I would love for folks to be able to access individuals within our district because they feel confident in knowing where they can go. So just moving forward, just making sure we clarify for folks where they go to engage in such processes. Sure, so in the student transfer that um, you're referring to, we reached out to the student over the weekend of today and made sure that she understood that as a senior, um, she would have to certainly be eligible once we're able to reconcile power school to confirm, you know, grades, attendance, behavior, sort of the thing I spoke about a moment ago in the 4150 revisions um, that will uh, that will follow that student to make sure she's able to apply. Um, we do have a uh, website that um, talks about these things, and we try to ensure that our, our our staff are aware of that, so they know to refer them to. Um, student services as opposed to to the board themselves I think sometimes what ends up being communicated is some version of well that's a county level decision right and so um, for people to be a little bit more nuanced to understand that's a county level dis decision that's sort of run through student services and then ultimately presented to the board we can certainly add that that nuance and texture sure so, Mr. Bethany, yes, to, to Miss Santa just point uh, you know I guess on the front uh, homepage of our website, I know we do have like a Q and A. So right. maybe the board members need because we do get a lot of sure. you know, emails, you know, phone calls regarding requests for different information. How to do right. that? So I think each board member should probably take a look at that website and see if you think that those that section is accommodating enough, or if we need to ask mm -hmm. different questions or provide different sure. information. And I think that would be good. We won't throw Miss Spoon a curve tonight, but maybe at some point in time, just reviewing that between the board members and. Uh, deciding yeah. if you know if you've gotten something that's just really not addressed on that site sure I think that's a good idea thank yeah. you and I'm not insinuating that oh, no. we hide information I'm just no, saying no. I think we should be last resort I think yep. folks come to us because they don't know where the answer is and we literally should be last resort sure I completely understand the concern I completely understand it there is something of a challenge in co sort of communicating to the public about this um, exception, right? It's, I mean, certainly these uh, the types of approval are uh, incredibly rare, right? And so um, when you sort of put that out on the front page, uh, it's sometimes difficult for people to um, understand that this is a rarity. We really have to emphasize on the one hand, we want to make people aware of this, but at the same time, make sure they understand this is an extreme, you know, an extreme rarity. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And I just want to clarify that. I, you know, I really meant that maybe we have questions like, do you have a question about transferring your student in or out of district? Sure. You know, just some generic yeah. questions that we, we do get a lot of, but not specific situations, I sure, guess. Sure, of okay. course. Okay, great. Ms. Blackwell, I'm good. Mr. Walter? Um, I think we get a lot of questions just because people know who we are. Actually, the first choice that they go to, because I know Keisha, or I know Rob, or I know who he is. I'm going to ask him a question because he's... Apparently the board member has all the answers, which we don't always have. So I do appreciate the work you're doing for that. And I think the website idea is, is a good one. So, okay. Mr. You. Furr. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter. And I can tell you, and, and John, you know, we have tried numerous times to try to streamline our policies mm -hmm. because certain policies are for certain ones. And this, and, and when we got uh, uh, the, what was it, title? What was it? We just went through the title. Title one. Title was it? Title one. We just went through the training on, and that redid everything. And we had certain standards we had to go through that, and we had to redo the policies on the the re revisions on that. Mm -hmm. And and so we are all the time revising the policies on that. And what what kind of appeals you had to go on that one. So we're all the time trying to change our policies to make sure you know how many days you have to do here, how mm -hmm. many, and so we're constantly trying to make it easier for the parents to understand, you know, if you're wanting to do this and trying to put it at a place they can find it. Uh, and so we try to make it as simple as we can and so they do know where they need to go and how yeah. they need to to do what they need to do. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Thank you, Ms. Adcock. 
Uh, no, I don't have any comments, but thank you for your service and what you do for our community of students. So this needs a motion. What does the motion have to say? It does. And I'm actually getting ready to read it. So may I have a motion? Okay, so I'm just going to read this for tonight. How about this? This is throwing the board chair a curve that she probably does. Who do I ask that question to? How do we fix that? <laughs> Actually, I'm just going to read it. I think that'll make it easier for you. Good. So do I have a motion from the board to determine pursuant to policy 4130 whether space is available in the school system and whether space is available in J.M. Robinson High School in particular, which is the school in which an out-of-district student seeks to enroll? So the motion, I'd make that motion, but we've already been told that there is space available. Yes, so but we make that determination from yes. his report. So right. is that's a yes or a no from the board? So do so I that's have a, a yes? Motion? Okay. Are you making the motion? Yes. Okay. So motion by Mr. Walter. I'll second. Second by Ms. Blackwell. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we will move to eleven point zero seven regarding the draft resolution and I will open it up for discussion one more time just before I ask for a motion to approve and I will begin with Ms. Adcock. I don't have any questions. Okay. Ms. Carpenter. I'm going to bring up something and probably everybody down at that end of the table is probably going to throw something up at me but uh, oh. since you are okay go ahead and throw it. Well we had our our members, our, our people come before us, and, and a lot of uh, the parents or people that spoke, they all brought up uh, critical race theory, and they did not want, I want the system to uh, uh, support that, our curriculum to support that. Uh, and they called it by name. Uh, so I'm bringing that up now. Our our resolution does not specify that, and so I'm just bringing that up. Now I have no problem at this point since the audi. I mean, since these people came, they waste they bought their time, and they said they did not want our system to do that, and they called it by name. Okay. And I have no problem with going ahead and saying that we will not adopt that curriculum and we do not support it. And I'm just making that statement. And I'm willing to go ahead and put it in this resolution. But if I do not have enough people to support that and go ahead and adopt what we had, that's fine. Okay. But I am bringing it up. Okay, so we'll hear from the rest of the board members and we'll okay. have a discussion. Mr. Furr. Uh, Kia, please. Well, I, I can go either way. I mean, we've discussed this a lot, and uh, and you know, it seems like that that the attorney we kind of went with with their I'm guessing their recommendation. So uh, they're the experts, but I'm like Miss uh, Carpenter. I can, if that's what we decide to do, I have no problem with that neither. Mr. Walter. Um, I'm actually okay with the way the language is here because it's, as some of our speakers brought up, that there's a lot of different things that are that are called CRT that are similar to it. We talked about SCL, right? We talked about all these other other things. I think this policy again, or this resolution saying what we believe in, certainly uh, is counter to those things. So I'm okay with the way it's working. Miss Blackwell. So to piggyback on what Rob said through discussion with our attorney. Um, you know, we want to make sure that the, the community understands where we stand as a board. And there's hot words right now that are out there, these buzzwords, and you can call it critical race theory. Some people have now intertwined it with um, social emotional learning. And per our attorney, they're separate. And we're going to educate the community on the separation between those two because we feel like that's important for people to, to understand. So what this resolution was set up to do was to really express our, um, our views as a board on the issues, maybe not the name itself, but people have defined critical race theory and social emotional learning through their own verbiage. And, and that's why it's getting skewed um, in the community. And so this was a statement 
that we specifically wanted to make sure that everyone would understand that they are created equal and we will treat them equally. And so I can go either way, but I do think that um, the most important thing is, is getting out there our ideas and our resolution and, and what our thoughts are and views are as a board. So that, that's my thought on it. Ms. Sandage. I'll concur with Laura and Rob. Um, I, I can't go either way. I don't think we need to list something that there's really no clear definition to. Um, there's no real clear um, understanding of. I equally think that it's just important that as a community and as a district, we work together to outline what learning should look like for our children because ultimately that learning impacts our community at the end of the day. These are kids who will grow up here and hopefully work here. So we just really got to begin to, if we haven't already been, been doing that, working together to define what learning looks like because it's important for all of our kids regardless of what they look like. Thank you. Mr. Why, Jay, would you like to, I, to, I guess more so, reiterate the comments that you made when we had the first part of the discussion? Well, the, like many people have talked about, it's, there's a lot of confusion about what does one person believe critical race theory versus another person. Uh, I think what we heard tonight was very consistent is uh, our children need to teach facts and need to learn facts, not opinions. And that's what we have in the resolution what was asked to be drafted. I do think that there is a blurring of lines between SEL and critical race theory. And the board is very adamant about what's important and what needs to be done for the, per for the community to know and how we are not going to be a discriminatory system. It's going to be non-discriminatory and everybody's treated equally no matter what they look like and no matter what their sex is. Thank you. Mr. Schultz, would you like to make any additional comments? Yeah, thank you. So I, I think that um, so the supports that we have in place in our district related to uh, this topic against discrimination and harassment, things like that. So we have policies in place. We have um, the Say Something app to report those things. We have a uh, bullet, uh, bullying reporting site to report those things. Um, you know, so my focus, as I kind of alluded to before, was the discrimination uh, piece of that, I, uh, the non, you know, not being non-discriminatory, uh, and I fully support that because the last, you know, five letters in community are, are uh, unity, and uh, whatever it takes our, for our community uh, to come together to support the gaps that exist from birth to either career or college, we have to attack those. Um, so if this gets us to that by, um, you know, helping, you know, eliminate discriminatory practices or making someone feel bad about um, their race or their gender, um, then I am in support of that. And, um, you know, ultimately that is a, a birth to adult uh, journey that we have to partner with the community on. So those are my comments. Thank you. So after hearing the speakers tonight, I think the majority uh, we're pleased with the verbiage and just ask that we pass the resolution tonight. So I feel comfortable just asking the board, may I have a motion to approve the resolution to ensure dignity and non-discrimination in schools? So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Blackwell. Second. A second by Ms. Adcock. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Motion passes 7-0. Board members, I just want to say tonight, I know this was a little bit um, Cumbersome, and I'll ask I'll, Ashton will tell you. Normally, we have a work session first, and that's where we do our business. We receive the information, and then we have a business meeting the second Monday, which is usually where we actually vote. July, we've combined it. So that also sometimes throws the board chair because guess what? We have to add last minute stuff that we need to get you know on the agenda as well. But everybody did a really good job tonight. Are there any other comments or questions from the board members? This is our only meeting uh, tonight, so I just want to make sure you have an opportunity. Anything, Ms. Adcock? No, I just um, want to thank all the board members because I think we have worked very hard and our community needs to know that. Absolutely. Ms. Carpenter? Mr. Furr? No. Mr. Walter? We're all on the same page. That's important. Ms. Blackwell? Absolutely what Denise said. Thank you. Ms. Sandage? No comments. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We have worked really hard.
So with that, that does conclude our meeting for tonight, and I would ask that the board convene in close, uh, I need a motion for the board to convene in closed session to consult with an attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege pursuant to General Statute 143-311, 318-11A3, and to consider confidential personnel matters pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11A6. So moved. I have a motion, motion by Ms. Blackwell and a second by Mr. Walter. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Thank you. And with that, we will say good night to our viewing audience, and we will see you at our Monday, August the 2nd, 2021 work session. Thank you and good night.